so thank you for having me. Uh, I'm quite uh, happy to be here on stage. That's my fourth time at 44Con, and I thought, yeah, for once uh, I should be, I should come, I should submit something, and be uh, on the stage to present. So here I am with uh, hunting for bugs, catching dragons. Uh, so my name is Nico. Uh, I'm French. Uh, I work for Microsoft Security Response Center in Cheltenham, uh, and I'm part of the vulnerability and mitigation team. Uh, uh, I'm very sorry to look like a zombie. <laughs> uh, I just have a baby with uh, dirty fingers and I'm learning to be a daddy the hard way. <laughs> so, sorry, uh, I try to do my best. Hopefully there won't be, uh, be an issue. Yes. So I'm going to uh, talk uh, about exploits uh, and bugs for affecting Outlook and Exchange. Uh, so I start with Outlook first. So the uh, first uh, part of this presentation will be focused on Outlook. Uh, I expect it to last uh, around for uh, 35 minutes, and then I spend another 10 minutes uh, on uh, on Exchange. Um, so for those of you who have no idea of uh, exploits in emails, I hope you learn something in this presentation. For those of you who already have practice, practiced a bit, I hope you still learn something. And for those of you who had already exploited uh, these uh, these applications, well, you and I should talk uh, after that talk <laughs> because I don't know you. <clears throat> so I, I expect, uh, I assume that you guys are not very familiar with uh, Outlook exploits. Uh, so I just show you something um, like shoulder. Yeah, just a short demo. So uh, try to think about it. Um, what, according to you, what's the worst case uh, for uh, Outlook? Let's say an exploit affecting Outlook. What would be the worst case? You would think, I believe, like something like the preview pen. You send and you got an email, and then you get it uh, on the preview pen, and then uh, uh, something happened and cat pops. Well, look at this one. You don't even need the preview pane to be owned. You just receive an email and your client gets on. That's one of the worst issues I've ever seen in my career. Um, this one is quite bad, so I'm not going to talk about it, uh, but instead I will show other uh, issues. So, no, let's pretend that uh, this never happened. <laughs> let's pretend that you haven't seen that. Uh, try to think about uh, there's, uh, there's exploits affecting uh, make clients. Um, when I think about it, uh, I believe that uh, the first uh, thing that come to my mind are those uh, worms that we saw in the early 2000s, like typically I love you. Uh, you'd get an email with a VB script attachment, you'd double click it, and then uh, you, that, uh, sorry, there are so many people in that room, and then uh, it would just spread and spread again. There was one other, I think uh, 1997, uh, the name of that virus was CAC, and this one was spreading with a JavaScript uh, signature. So you'd send an email with a JavaScript uh, signature, and then it would just run JavaScript code, and then auto-spread. And that was uh, quite a nice exploit as well. Um, but now think uh, more, uh, something more recently. Um, so we had uh, Hey Feli, a good friend of mine. <clears throat> he reported us uh, an exploit uh, that he named uh, Badwin Mail in two f late 2015. So basically, he managed to uh, find a way to build uh, an email containing a Flash object. And, uh, and with a known a Flash vulnerability, he managed to get RC on this. Um, there's also that that uh, uh, that person, Ryan Hansen. Um, so you know, it's uh, it's one day at the MSRC, or I'm, where I'm checking the queue, and suddenly I see uh, three emails from uh, somebody that I don't know, three emails reporting bugs in Microsoft Outlook, and I'm reading their uh, their uh, the quick notes. I'm like, if only half of this is true, then then it's really bad. It turns out that uh, this guy was great, and everything he said was true. So this day we got three amazing. And then there is a last class of issues. There is uh, those uh, where we see the exploit and we just don't know that Outlook is affected. I'm thinking, for example, about the exploits that we saw in the wild uh, targeting Ward about two, three years ago. Um, so the attackers there were uh, attacking people using Word uh, with uh, with some fonts, so sending a document with uh, a malicious font. Uh, the thing is that 
nobody never realized that this also applied to Outlook. Uh, so that, that leads us to the attack surface of Outlook. It's quite big, to be honest. I uh, think first about emails. So anything that is present in, a, in an email it can be like is a formatting, like HTML, can be uh, fonts, fonts somebody in, uh, in an email, can be pictures, can be links, attachments, of course, don't want to double click them, uh, can be calendars, uh, can be all sorts of things. There are also protocols, obviously. Uh, SMTP, POP3, uh, the Exchange, uh, Active Sync one. Uh, there used to be an NTP, but I think this one is gone. Uh, also, uh, all the issues that relate to spoofing, uh, like fraud with certificates, uh, like anything that has to do with the identities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and obviously, uh, well, all the remainings, like we are dealing with an office application, so think about macros, think, for example, about a scenario where you'd get an email, and uh, that email would execute macros. Well, I've never seen that, and I hope that this does not exist, but just uh, have this in mind. Also, uh, think about Sanspost, uh, their rulers attack. So this was assuming that they had the control of a box of, yeah, of, a, of a mailbox and they were trying to leverage that to get uh, code execution on, uh, on the client. Uh, so obviously I just have 45 minutes here, so I'm not going to talk about everything. I just uh, talk about uh, the rich text format, uh, some early objects, some attachments, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, TNEF and IP properties. Before I dive in, uh, why this talk? Uh, so I told you I'm uh, I'm working for Microsoft. So you might be thinking, this guy, he says he's from Microsoft, and he's going to teach us how to hack Outlook, right? Um, well, yes, uh, but that's not the point. The point is that there are all these exploits out there and uh, we don't know them. Uh, occasionally, we only receive good reports of vulnerabilities, but that's very, that's very occasionally. Uh, two days ago, there was Patch Tuesday. One bug was uh, was fixed. I believe this was uh, this one was interesting. But there are all the others. So from time to time, I'm uh, bumping into someone and you say, "Oh, Nico, yeah, uh, uh, last Patch Tuesday, you killed uh, three of my bugs. Ah, <laughs> that's that's too bad because those were good. Huh, sorry for you, man. Uh, how do I kill the others?" <clears throat> So why are people not reporting to us? Uh, is it because it's too difficult? Well, yeah, possibly. Uh, I mean, uh, you don't have scripting engines in a uh, make client. It's not like you're attacking a browser. It's not like you've got uh, that memory corruption that you're going to be able to leverage easily uh, to get uh, to get your exploit. It's more difficult than that. Uh, why else? Uh, perhaps because there's no symbols for Office? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. This I cannot help you. But still. Um, there are some good offers around there. For example, our friends at Tipping Point, uh, they are offering these nice bounties of, on uh, Exchange and Outlook, 200K for Outlook, 250 for Exchange. Zerodium also is, by, is uh, giving the same amount, 250 for uh, Exchange or, or Outlook. So there is, a, there is, there is, a, there is some place, there is some room for our research. How can we help or find us? Let's just talk about war on research and things that we've seen. So that's why I will be presenting uh, things I've seen myself and things that people have been reporting us. And obviously, quick disclaimer, uh, everything that has been, uh, that is uh, mentioned here has obviously been fixed <coughs> before. So where shall we start? Uh, I've borrowed that slide from a uh, high face presentation at Cantec uh, two, year, two, days, uh, two years ago. Uh, so when you, when you start looking for Outlook, features, uh, you quickly uh, figure that there is something called uh, TNEF emails. And when uh, you Google that, I think that the first link that you see is a page from Microsoft uh, describing uh, the TNEF uh, format. And uh, among the, uh, all the things that are said on this page, there is this. It's uh, just a container for Outlook special features. And this is exactly what we are after. We are after these features that give you remote code execution. <clears throat> so what's a TNEF email? Uh, so just, uh, just, a, just a container, basically. So 
You've got your client and you select, uh, you can choose the format of your email, either HTML, plain text, or rich text format. You choose rich text format, you send it. And then on the other side, you get this email, for example. You check on the server and uh, there is that thing, meme headers, uh, and then some content. You see application MSTNF and you wonder what it is, something encoded in base64. You decode that, and then there's this data verse, uh, just like uh, a file with some binaries. Uh, so obviously, what is this? <clears throat> So as with most of uh, Microsoft formats, uh, this one is publicly documented. Uh, it's quite easy to follow. Uh, so just a, roughly just a sequence of objects and attributes uh, that uh, that are that are in in a file basically. So uh, for this research, I built. Uh, Oh, I know one no template. So I've been asked, uh, if this thing was, uh, public. Uh, so it's not public, but I've got a deal for you. You send me a good bug and I published it and, uh, and in turn you'll get also a nice blog post. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so there is often a confusion between, uh, TNF and, uh, RTF. Uh, so when you send that email in a rich text format, you might have the feeling that you are just sending an RTF document. Uh, it's partly true. You're sending that RTF document, but it's actually embedded in a TNF container. So there, you're saying this RTF along with many other uh, properties. <clears throat> This RTF document is embedded in that uh, PR RTF compressed properties. Various encodings. Uh, first one is uh, the one by default, uh, the compressed one, so uh, a custom LZMA uh, encoding. And the other one is something that you normally uh, don't see, because I don't believe that with the UI it's possible to send those emails. So Mela, uh, just a plain text uh, email. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Usually, uh, occasionally, we get uh, cases where our finder have been fuzzing, uh, our finders have been fuzzing as an MSG uh, file format, and um, and most of the time, it's uh, this is just because they they fuzzed the uh, the compressed part and managed to trigger some random memory corruption. Well, most of the time, this is going to fail because the parser is quite pedantic. So, if you want to fuzz this part, uh, just use, for example, the Outlook interrupt library, it will help you uh, just select your RTF file and uh, send it uh, on the wire. So it's much easier and it will just give you much, much false positives uh, than uh, just fuzzing the, the bits with uh, like a shotgun, like typically things that we've seen. It still works because we are still fixing those cases. I think there was one uh, fixed about a month ago, uh, but uh, most of the time it won't give you any results. <clears throat> So now uh, let's talk about some examples of issues that we've seen affecting Outlook. So uh, when I'm talking about RTF, I'm also talking about Word because Outlook uses a Word uh, core library to parse uh, these RTF emails. So anything that affects wor that Word parser, that Word RTF parser, might also affect Outlook. That's why occasionally uh, when there is an issue affecting the RTF uh, file format, you will see that the built-in that we published are critical and not important. It's because most of the time this code can also be uh, reached from uh, Outlook and the preview pane. So now think about the uh, RTF specifications. There might be things that uh, that shouldn't be found in um, in Outlook, but should still be found in, in Word. And uh, that leads me to the template keyword. I didn't find that one. Uh, Ryan Hansen did. Uh, so what did he figure out? So it was 2000, um, 2017, I think. Um, he found a way. Uh, he figured out that it was possible to send an email uh, uh, in RTF that has this, uh, this template uh, keyword in it. And then you would point that template somewhere, for example, on uh, either on the web, like with HTTP, on a remote chair. And then in that template, you would embed a flash object. And so he figured out that even if uh, high face bad wind mail had been fixed, uh, there was still a path, uh, one possible way to get code execution with Flash. And, um, and he was true, because uh, if you look at the code, uh, you can see that uh, we fixed uh, the way that 
Outlook was supposed to instantiate objects, but we didn't realize that it was also possible to get the same behavior using templates. And uh, so that was embarrassing. Um, but there's not only uh, the problem with uh, these objects. Think about the template keywords. Uh, you can just uh, put whatever you want here, like for example, uh, a link on a web share, and then uh, and then uh, you guys like it, uh, uh, getting the anti LMF, for example, and then that's an easy uh, uh, and that's an easy win. There's also the fact that uh, in that case you just extend the attack surface. Uh, suddenly you're able to uh, you are able to have out Outlook load uh, every binary format that uh, Word supports, uh, XML, uh, HTML, uh, the legacy binary formats, everything. So just uh, all of a sudden, everything that affects Word also affects Outlook, So which means that uh, that's very bad. Another issue affecting uh, this template, uh, this one I've, I found it myself. Um, so say that you've got a document that uh, that is linked to a template, and this template points to another template with the same name, but for some reason, uh, this template isn't uh, accessible. For example, it's uh, hosted on a remote share, and then you don't have uh, you don't have uh, the access to uh, to uh, to go to that share. So that will just trigger a nice user after free in Outlook. Uh, can you, uh, or world, can you exploit that? It's probably complicated, but, well, as you can guess, there are lots of issues affecting the template uh, keyword, and uh, so what do you think happened there? Yeah, uh, for once, we just remove the feature. It's not something that we often see. Usually, uh, the teams try to fix the issue, but there are cases where we just uh, remove the feature, because, uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be there. I come back now to the uh, Outlook interrupt library. Uh, so if you like uh, C-sharp, uh, it's probably the easiest way to build an email. Um, so look at uh, look at this uh, this piece of code. There is something here called the message class property. So by the way, everything here is uh, properly documented. So just go uh, on, uh, on Microsoft website and you'll find all the documentation there. So look at this message class. Uh, it said IPM contact. So what is that exactly? If you send uh, this email, uh, and, and if you receive it on, uh, on the Outlook side, you will get this. Instead of having your email with uh, uh, your text, you will see the contact form. Because uh, it's possible with Outlook and with a TLNF format to send uh, basically whatever forms uh, that Outlook support on the wire. So there are like contact forms, uh, calendars, tasks, uh, well, uh, many of them. And what's interesting is that each of this form, uh, each of these forms has, uh, its own properties and its own code. For example, this one, uh, on the top right corner, there is a picture. And you're going to say, yeah, but, uh, what's, what's the benefit of this? Because if you send an email, you can already include pictures. That's true. But the thing is, here, uh, Outlook is not using uh, the standard path to parse that picture. Instead, it's using the GDI or GDI plus stack uh, instead of uh, just the office stack, which means that if you've got a, a vulnerability or an exploit affecting the GDI stack in Windows, then you might also be able to uh, use it here in that email. There are other uh, like things specific to those, uh, those, uh, those properties, but be aware that uh, when you do that, there might be hidden features that you might be able to, uh, to, to exploit. <clears throat> um, so as I said, there are all these uh, all these message class uh, all these message classes, and uh, more can be found uh, on that website. There are, there are even some that are not documented, but you guys are reversers, so uh, you know how to find them. Just look for strings in the binary. Um, let's talk about uh, issues now affecting these uh, these classes. So uh, we received that one. I think it was summer 2016, something like that. Uh, so Etienne Stallman, uh, he reported an email uh, using the IPM remote class, and this was triggering just a null pointer in the preview pane. So for bugs like this, uh, we are not going to issue a CVE because uh, they don't they don't qualify for a bar. So this is just a moderate issue. But still, it's still interesting, because uh, at least it shows some hidden behavior, uh, things that uh, shouldn't happen. Uh, and see, it made it uh, up to this presentation today. So thanks, Etienne. 
Uh, I'm going no, to spend more time now showing, uh, talking about the IPM document classes. So this one again was uh, uh, submitted to us by Ryan, Ryan Hansen. Um, so imagine an email where you have uh, two attachments, uh, two Word documents attached. So one is uh, a normal RTF file, and the other one is that IPM document uh, things. When you open the first one, the first attachment, uh, you'll see Word pop up, but Word will pop up in, uh, in protected mode, in protected view. So this is fine. However, in the other one, uh, protected view won't be started and you will, you will have world, um, just uh, popping in uh, medium integrity. So, which means that the sandbox is not gone. Um, so, and there is also that other case, uh, opening, sending mail, sending emails and having uh, office documents uh, running without user interaction. So I'm going to, to just uh, quickly, if you want to try that, uh, that's a POC. I'm going to show you a demo of these two cases combined. So send that, say that you send an email and, uh, instead of, uh, just, uh, having some text, you've got Word that shows up in the preview pane. Uh, that's fine. So this one is running in app container. So, uh, project view is, uh, correctly, uh, open. Uh, is, uh, correctly starting and that's fine. Now, what do you think happen if you double click, uh, that email? Then something else is going to happen. Word will show up, but this time using uh, the com automation. And if you look at it, you'll see that, uh, project view is now gone. <clears throat> You guys are reversers, so you're a bit curious of how this works. <clears throat> so I've got another demo for you. This is all about uh, com stuff. And if you look at the code, you'll see that uh, Word was launched in the first demo with automation because at some point there is a class ID that says that yeah, that's a Word document. But what happens if you send another class ID, like typically uh, the equation uh, editor class ID? So remember, about two years ago, we had uh, this exploit involving the equation editor. Uh, it was just possible to trigger that in Outlook. Not with zero click, just one click away. So be aware that when there are exploits like this that affect Word, sometimes it's also possible to have them uh, uh, work on Outlook. All right, I'm now going to move slowly to all the objects. But first, uh, let me talk about the other file format that uh, Outlook supports. So I've just been talking about the email format, basically .email. Uh, there is another one that Outlook supports, the message for, uh, format. Um, several ways to generate this files. Uh, for example, copy-paste uh, from the client to the desktop, or you can also use the uh, interrupt library to just generate that. Uh, this one is, is good in a way that uh, it will give you everything that has been uh, generated in that code. Uh, uh, if you do the copy paste uh, from uh, Outlook client to desktop, sometimes you're losing some information. So uh, bear that in mind. So when you do that, uh, and when you op try to open this, uh, this message uh, format, you'll see that <clears throat> This is actually a Nori storage that you have, so just not a random binary file. Nori storage uh, consisting of streams and uh, stop storage. Notice, for example, the property version uh, 1.0, top stream. I come back to it uh, in a in a second. Um, Mappy properties. Mappy properties are essentially described by uh, three uh, three different uh, properties. So the first one is the PID. Uh, so here, for example, uh, one, 1A or oh, 1F, uh, it's also described by its type. Here, 1F for a Unicode string and its value. So here, IPM.txt. Um, so the, the types follow the, the Windows variant types. So it's very really easy to read them. Free for an integer, five for a float, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the relationship between the email file format and the message file format? Uh, look at the properties, uh, the first stream, the property version stream. And you'll see, for example, uh, this, uh, this property. So everything in that stream is encoded on 16 bytes. So uh, for example, for uh, uh, this property, which is an integer, you will see the value at offset plus eight. So here, just a sequence of zeros. Um, for, for this one, which is a string, uh, and its size is set to 12, 
so obviously there's not enough room for uh, for um, for it uh, to be contained in that stream. So uh, Outlook will just create another stream for you. So if you want to fuzz this file format, just be aware of this uh, this specificities, because otherwise you will just uh, like. Uh, Hit the parsers and uh, and we it will just render nothing. So you will just uh, lose your time. Let's come now to the early object. So from high phase research, we know that it's uh, unfortunately possible to uh, embed some objects in an email. Um, for example, this object, uh, if you follow the Windows variant types, uh, they can be either and they can end either with zero line or zero D. So in Outlook, uh, they all end with zero D. So here uh, you've got uh, this property, which I forgot. Uh, well, something thirty-seven. Uh, O1, O, OD, which means that you've got a uh, sub storage, an object, uh, and some subs, either some subs over sub storages or over streams in it. And this is interesting in this research because when you're dealing with all the objects, uh, you're dealing with all the functions that are uh, in uh, OD32. So I appreciate that uh, you don't have the symbols for Office, but you do have those for Windows. And if you're curious, you can just put your breakpoints on the usual suspects. Uh, essentially, uh, here, uh, read message class, only open storage, or even only load. And if you do that, you realize quickly that there are, I think, three class IDs that are handled uh, differently in Outlook. First ones are for the meta files. I think one is for a bitmap pictures, and the last one is for the only uh, standard link. Now you see where I'm going. Uh, back, I think, two years ago, we saw all these exploits involving communicators. Uh, most of them were just uh, embedded in Word documents or Excel documents. Uh, I don't believe that anybody uh, noticed that it was also possible to trigger the same attacks in Outlook, unfortunately. <clears throat> So the attacks uh, that I'm now going to show you uh, are all coming from uh, these, uh, these common makers. So uh, just if you uh, look a bit at the code, you'll see that from Oli load, once you've modified the, all, the zero one Oli stream, you are able to hit this code, all, um, read moniker stream, which in the end, uh, just call Oli load from stream. And if you look at the documentation, this is just about reading uh, an object from a stream and instantiate it on the iPerse stream uh, interface. How do we exploit that? Will Dorman, I think, was the first one uh, to report uh, that behavior to us. So uh, two years, three years ago, maybe he noticed that uh, if we use Outlook 97 or maybe Outlook 2000, it was possible to send an email with a link to an object. And uh, in that link, you would specify a path on a remote share, for example. And he noticed that if you do that, when uh, the victim would open uh, that email in, uh, in his uh, Outlook client, then uh, uh, with Wireshark, you could see some traffic going to that uh, to that web share, and uh, and then the IP address along with, for example, the NTLM hash would be leaked. And so uh, he was worried about this, and that was a, that was a legitimate worry. And then uh, he figured out that if you even have an SMB uh, vulnerabilities, it was also possible to trigger it uh, just with it. So I'm talking about SMB client vulnerabilities. So his attack here was just you send a, you send an email, and then this email is going to uh, just blue screen your uh, your um, your box. Uh, that's annoying. It's not an RC, but still, it's annoying. <clears throat> Uh, there is more that you can do with the file moniker. If you've ever uh, reversed it, <clears throat> there is uh, that 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 function that is called at some point a restore shell link. So what is that thing doing? Uh, you know about the Windows uh, shortcuts? <clears throat> it's actually possible to embed them to embed them in these uh, file monikers. And it say that you've got a variety affecting the Windows shortcuts, and that still happened. Uh, one was corrected two days ago. It's definitely possible to trigger it in Outlook. So is it possible to load a remote library with it, uh, like we saw with Stocknet? I don't know, I haven't tried, but I'm assuming that potentially it is. Just to say that there are always things uh, hidden here and there that might be able to uh, 
to uh, to trigger on um, on Outlook. <coughs> so give me a second. <coughs> I'm not going to um, talk about another moniker, the Objref one. So I did that research about three years ago, yeah, summer 2016. Uh, and I'm, at that time, I didn't know about the other monikers, like the new moniker, the Q monikers, like everything that has been exploited in 2017, 2018. I didn't know about that. But I'm glad I followed that one. So what's that one? This one is just about unmarshalling uh, objects that have been um, marshaled with a trusted marshaller. Um, how do you exploit that? Uh, how do you, uh, you know that you can send an email and uh, this email will just unmarshal a common object, but still, how do you get code execution from this? So first step, you're going to call co and marshal interface with something that has been, uh, that is trusted. So uh, there is a list of trusted marshallers, not so many of them, I think 15. Uh, so it's quite easy to look, to, to look them all and probably find some bugs. Uh, so the first uh, component that I noticed was this one, affecting the vid control um, uh, library. And this one was interesting because when you look at the code, uh, so this is a code that is triggered when you open a stream. And so you see there is a loop that takes a counter and then it's going to take like come objects from the stream, instantiate them, and then uh, initialize them on the IPC stream init interface. And that init interface is important. It's different than the normal IPC stream init. That, sorry, it's different than the normal IPC stream interface. If you've done some uh, browser research, uh, you know, for example, that, that Flash uh, starts with this interface. So at that point, I know I had a, that I had an email and I was able to trigger Flash. So I could get a remote code execution with Flash. And then, so this was summer 2016, so I had been at Microsoft for about uh, nine months, and somebody told me, uh, Nico, so now you're at Microsoft, you need to leave Flash alone and forget about it. Uh, there is enough for you to do at Microsoft. All right, fair enough. Uh, so I had to find something else. So there are not uh, that many um, that many uh, controls uh, starting with the IPC stream in it. Uh, so I just tried them all. And I noticed that uh, for this one, uh, the XML feed moniker, if you were giving it uh, some HTML, uh, it would just load it and load the scripts that, that, were, uh, that were contained. Uh, so that's it. At that moment, I had an email that was able to instantiate some VB scripts. It was not enough because uh, I was still locked uh, inside VB. I couldn't, like, for example, instantiate the file system object and uh, write to files. Uh, so I still have to find something else. Uh, I just used a VB zero day because, well, you know, there are some. <laughs> uh, but m more interestingly, uh, what was fixed with these attacks? So first, uh, everything that had to do with that, uh, that vid, that vid control. So this was a trusted marshaller and it was very, very, uh, important, crucial that everything that was on marshal with that library was trusted. There were at least three CVs, uh, on this. Uh, do some research. Maybe you can find others. Hopefully not. <clears throat> The XML feed monitor and the objref, uh, I'm glad that uh, I did that research because then we added them to the COM activation filter uh, in Office. So now it's not possible to load these COM objects anymore. Uh, it might still be possible to load the objref in Visio because I think there is a one weird use case, but that's, uh, that's another story. For all the other applications, uh, this is now gone. Do not load all the objects in the pane. I didn't put the preview pane here. I'm just talking about the panes uh, in Outlook in general. Because when you get an email and you reply to or you forward it, then that's another pane that is going to show up. And so at some point I had a case where it was possible to get code execution just by hitting reply to. Uh, to that email. So you wouldn't get code execution, that bug wouldn't trigger when you were reading the email, but if you reply to, then yes, uh, you would be on by it. Uh, fixed another VBScript bug, yeah. Uh, but more importantly now, it's not possible to load VBScript anymore, uh, at least on the recent branches. Uh, 
And then something, uh, something quite cool. And if, uh, restrict objects loaded by the diagnostic service. And if you follow that presentation so far, you should be like, what is he talking about? Think about that, uh, that attack. Uh, it's not only affecting Outlook, it's affecting all, all the, the COM objects in general, or all the objects that are marshaled in Windows. Windows is just about uh, objects uh, sent from one application to another. And if you can uh, abuse this marshal, this trust tree marshal, then you can do crazy things with this. Uh, think about variants and safe arrays. Safe arrays, for example, uh, just an array containing a uh, different type of variants. When you, when you do, uh, when you're creating your application and you're using a safe array, you don't specify the type on the, on the safe array. You can uh, do some check later, but when you use a safe array, it can, it's a, a generic, uh, array. It can contain whatever, um, so no, so think about, uh, a case where you would, uh, for example, load a safe array containing strings. Uh, so you would be, you would have your strings marshaled in that safe array, and then on the other side, the code would just uh, see that there is some string in the safe array, and then unmarshal everything. So. Now think about what would happen if you, instead of uh, giving strings, you give objects exactly the same. Those objects would uh, would be unserialized for you. And so, so if you think about it, uh, and if you can find an application uh, that works on RPC and that allows that supports um, these safe arrays, you you've 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 already won. For example, think uh, about this one, the diagnostic service. I didn't know about that service at first. Uh, I think I learned from it at Pond 2016 uh, that South Korean guy, Lucky Heart, he managed to uh, exploit, I think it was IE at that point, or was it H? I don't remember. Uh, he managed to exploit it just by uh, having uh, his own library loaded by a system service. And uh, when you look at it, you're like, how am I supposed to know that these things exist? wasn't that trivial. I mean, there were some uh, restrictions. It wasn't possible just to load a library. Uh, you needed to bypass some checks, but still, that's, that's what he managed, and he managed to do. And usually, uh, it's not possible to do anything with that service. But I'm not uh, looking at, uh, at things that I can do with that service. I was just looking for functions exported by this service, and there was one, so get draft data updates. That was exactly what I was looking for. Because here, this function takes in parameter a safe array. And I think this was a safe array of string. Yeah, if you look, uh, if you look at, uh, at the prototype, you see counter ID as B string. So here the code is just waiting for strings. But what happens if you send, uh, objects instead? Well, the code will just unmarshal them for you. And, and once you're in that function and it's checking if you've already actually provided some string, it's already too late. Your objects have already been marshaled. I've got a demo for you showing that. Uh, so you just receive an email, and uh, and then magic will happen uh, in a preview plan. You click it, and then stuff happens in the background, and you get on, and then you system payload. <clears throat> These attacks work, and not just only here for the purpose of that demo. Uh, they are quite reliable, and I'm definitely looking for them. This is what I call a dragon, by the way. Uh, so that's it for Outlook. I'm now going to uh, talk about Exchange. Um, so what I find difficult these days when I start a new project, uh, so basically when I want to attack a product, is uh, how do I do that? Uh, what what was previously done? Uh, how can I get some ideas from what was previously done? Uh, can I get some inspiration? Uh, because usually I just don't know the target. And so for Exchange, uh, when I looked at it, uh, I just I just looked at what had been done before, and unfortunately there was not much. There was that exploit uh, that we saw from uh, the shadow brokers, uh, we, uh, the exploit called Englishman Dentist. What was it about? Uh, this was about sending an email to Exchange 2003 on Windows Server 2003, and then uh, when you would view that email in, uh, in uh, Outlook Web Apps, 
uh, it would reach a point where uh, you could uh, you could download uh, what well, you could force the code on the server to download a picture encoded in a, in a, in a Mac format, and then there was a Stack Overflow issue with the library parsing it, and then you would get a code execution there. But this is. Exchange 2003 on Windows 2003. How can I get this attack to work on Exchange 2019, for example? Um, another issue that was uh, interesting. Uh, so this was uh, submitted to us by uh, by ZDI. So it's not uh, it's, it's not really about uh, emails, but it's more about uh, you already have a control of on a, on a box and, uh, and you leave a voicemail and you uh, you play with the mappy properties and then uh, you'll get a .NET deserialization and it will just unmarshal uh, some code for you and then you get RC on the server that's not exactly what I'm what I'm looking after but when you look at what has been done before in the past for exchange this is this is what you'll see so definitely not much <clears throat> So also think about the scenarios. Uh, what are we looking for? How are we attacking that? Are we, uh, are we unauthenticated? Uh, or do we already have some creds on the system? What sort of attack are we trying to, to do? Are we trying XSSs in OWA? Are we trying memory corruptions? Uh, think also that, uh, no, these days, uh, Exchange is essentially a .NET application. Uh, is it really a .NET application? Huh. Look at the components there. There is that one, XRPC32. I'll come back to it in a second. But some tools essential for this research, MFC Mappy. This one is uh, just about opening your box, your inbox, and uh, looking at all the emails, all the objects that are in that inbox. And the, the amount of things that you can do with that, this tool is just huge. You can, uh, one thing that, uh, that I really liked is that you could, uh, you were able to drop literally everything, drop it in a TNDF format, and then that would give you some mappy properties that Outlook was unable to generate, for example. And I found some bugs just by replaying the as mappy properties in emails, and this was this was this was very cool. If you do some research like this, uh, bear that in mind, because there are things here that are very worth it. <clears throat> Excel PC, no. So as I said, Exchange is mostly just a .NET, a huge .NET application, but there are still a couple of uh, binary uh, binaries here and there that uh, that are coded in C or C++. Excel PC is one of them. When I looked at it at the fr uh, initially, I uh, well, I've got the source code, so I first looked at the source code, and then I started IDA also, just to have uh, an idea of what was going on. And I noticed uh, some functions that were directly working on the mappy properties uh, taken from an email. Is there some bug left uh, here? Let's see. Uh, so look at, for example, this EC parse entry ID function. Uh, you see that there's, uh, if you look at it in IDA, um, you see that there's a huge function uh, which uh, dispatches to other functions depending on the multi properties. And usually you've got some code that ensure that the multi property you've submitted is of a valid type. So for example here, uh, either a string or a Unicode string. But there were two cases where these checks uh, were not done. This one, for example. Uh, so here, we would just, uh, this function was supposed to take a byte array, but you could uh, instead submit anything, like for example a float. So what would happen here is just a null difference in uh, the delivery process. Uh, can you exploit that? Probably not, because uh, of the way variants are encoded on 64 bits, it was probably just uh, those at worst. But at worst, but I'd love to be proven wrong here. So if you've got some time and want to do some research, uh, have a look at it. It's interesting. There was that other case, um, EC make filler from um, from FEL. Uh, so when I looked at this function, I didn't see the check at first. The checks for uh, for the, the property, the, t the type of property. It turns out that check is not done. Uh, above in the calling function, but it's done in that function itself. So there was no possibility for a type confusion here. But then I looked at the code and I noticed that with IDA, not looking at the source code. It was possible at some point to write uh, a bit uh, to the buffer that was submitted, the buffer that came uh, from that email. So in particular conditions, it was possible just to go out of the bound by one bit. That sounds cool. 
that's typically the kind of issue that uh, you'd be able to exploit in a browser. So how much time do I have? Yeah, probably two, two minutes left. So what do you think I did? <laughs> Something crazy, right? I did nothing. <laughs> it was too hard. I think I spent about two weeks there, uh, trying to figure out a way to exploit that, uh, I couldn't find anything. Uh, essentially because of the way the heap works in, uh, in, uh, in .NET and uh, in, the, in this, uh, this application. Is it possible to exploit it? I adopt it. But again, feel free to do some research and, uh, and prove me wrong. I want now to mention quickly uh, something else. Uh, so, I, so there was a, a bug that was fixed about uh, three months ago in Exchange, and uh, some people on Twitter asked me uh, what it was about. And I told them I will talk about that later. I'm talking about it now. Um, think about OWA, no, because I haven't talked about that. Uh, Office Web Apps. Um, so that's a that's a client that's supposed to run it in your web server, uh, in uh, in your browser. So there are obviously uh, functionalities, features that are not available there, but some of them are still available. And for example, if you send uh, an RTF email uh, containing objects, there's uh, all the objects, there's all the objects obviously won't be rendered in your browser, but there will still be things that will be rendered. Like for example, pictures. So say that you've got your only object, and then there is an image that is encoded with these only objects. And something there on that server must be uh, extracting that 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 picture for you. So I looked a bit at the code, and uh, so everything is done in OLE32. So we've got the symbols, so you, you can look at it. And it turns out that various uh, picture formats were accepted. Uh, so usually uh, the um, WMF, but it was also possible to specify an EMF picture. And when I saw that, I figured, oh, this this must be bad because there are so many things that you can do with EMF. And so this was exactly what this advisory was about. Do not load EMF pictures on the server side. So I got one last demo for you, <clears throat> where I'm just sending an email, uh, and then my victim just open it uh, in OWA, and then that will just blue screen uh, the action server. You like it, right? I liked it too. <laughs> So to conclude, uh, just a, a few uh, few things about that research. I didn't manage to get code execution and exchange, although I tried. I tried things. I, I wasn't successful. Uh, I wanted to get something unauthenticated. I found some bugs where that were more interesting, but you needed to be uh, authenticated. I didn't try to exploit them. Uh, unfortunately, for uh, those that I found, I don't believe they were exploitable. Uh, but what can you guys found that's what I'm interested in to see. Some references, uh, if you want to check that, uh, the slides are, are online. And, uh, and thank you all. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>